This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it, man, I know it, I know. Obviously, he's very decorated. Uh, he's been high-stakes MTTs for the better part of a decade. Just been absolutely mashing online. He's a party poker ambassador. Yeah. Head of, or former head of B Staking, which they dissolved. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, from my experience with him, though, it's, you know, a lot of our interaction is taking place on Twitter. And I just think that he's, like, a good representative. Uh, very specifically for online MTTs, but also for the game in general. Like, he seems to have a big picture view which I think a lot of people with the spotlight tend to lack. So, so makeup as a model is very flawed. I don't think there's any company in the world who has had a makeup model which is uh, still running or as long-term they've kept it as a makeup model. The, there's been some other alternative models suggested and implemented. I know Ben Solsky had an expiring makeup mm -hmm. model where essentially – you played a number of games and after you played 600 or 700 games or 2000 games or however many games, the makeup was just wiped off and you got like a lower percentage of profit or so something along those lines, yeah. which in theory is the best way to do it. But in reality, if you're staking a guy or if you're staking, you know, 200 guys and 150 of them uh, are down after a thousand games and they know after 2000 games, their makeup gets wiped, they're very incentivized from a selfish point of view to rush the next thousand games, get them over and done with and start a new slate and get into uh, the process of making profit, you know? So there's basically no model which is being created by any company which has been long-term uh, profitable. There's been probably, I would say, a thousand plus stables in the yeah. last 10 to 15 years, I would imagine, like, from sizes of like five players up to, you know, like thousands of players. And there's probably like five or like less than five, which have stood the test of time. So it's, it's not a model. And but the re one of the reasons why is what you said, uh, tournaments is all about, uh, these big series like scoop W cube WSOP, if you're a live player and your ABI goes up dramatically. And then afterwards, and most people will either, most people lose, uh, because that's just how tournaments work, you know, like nine, most people will lose during a big series. And then afterwards you're just fucked because, uh, because you're in such big makeup and you have to go back to a lower buy. And especially over the last three years, I'd say since Bitcoin exploded, the high buy-ins have just got higher and higher. I know that like four years ago when I was playing what was seen as high stakes MTTs, the highest buy-in was like a 215 Sunday warm up on PokerStars and maybe like a free 20 now and again. And then you had like a super Tuesday on a Tuesday, 1K, which was really special. But like there was no regular high buy-ins. Whereas now, you know, every Sunday there's a 25K, 10K, 5K, like really, really, really high yeah. buy-ins. And people get into makeups, which are psychologically a lot tougher to handle. What you said is correct about the average buy-in, about the average buy-in going up in series. That's always been the case for like 15 years. There's, there's always been a scoop in w -Coop. But the thing is now the the high buy-ins are just getting so, so high for whatever reason, which is really bad for everybody. Um, and because of that, people are losing money, which they're just like really uncomfortable to lose. Um, Tell us yeah. about that. Tell us about that. Like why, why, <clears throat> why is it bad? When you say like it's bad for everybody, not like, I don't think everybody understands that. A lot of amateurs, when they lose, they just don't come back because the experience of getting money online, the experience of getting money offline, the experience of documents, all that kind of stuff, um, it's so poor. And mm -hmm. Berkey will tell you, again, back in the day, PokerStars was so good at this because their customer support was so good. They understood what everyone needed and they didn't have all the governments down their throat. If you had a problem with PokerStars, you got a message back in two minutes and you got your money online. And this is why so many amateurs love playing on both Fulltilt and PokerStars because it was so easy to get, it was too easy to get money online, you know? Yeah. Whereas now it's so, so tough to get money online. So if I have a bankroll of say $50,000 on PokerStars, I will do absolutely everything to protect that money. Like going broke, like going stars broke or going GG broke or going party broke is such a disaster because you, 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 you don't have money for the next Sunday, essentially. So mm. because the buy-ins go up, up, and up, because we're all DJs, we all want to play as high as possible, 
but uh, when you register that tournament and you don't cash, which you won't cash in 90, like uh, 85% of the time, you then go broke and you can't play the next tournament. So it's better for the site if I play 25 1K mm -hmm. buy-ins rather than 125K buy-in. It's better for the amateur because he loses slower. Mm -hmm. um, the pros probably make more money because more people can take shots and mm -hmm. more amateurs can get $1,000 online and recycle it and cash a PSG get a bounty and recycle that, et cetera. So the higher, higher buy-ins, they don't really benefit anyone. And when, when somebody does have that big bink, whether it be you know a million or two million or whatever else, that's usually withdrawn really quickly yeah. uh, and it's out the ecosystem straight away, you know? Um, whereas if you cash, you know, say 70,000 in a 1K, you probably leave it online mm -hmm. if you want to use it for the next Sundays or whatever it for may sure. be. So sure. I don't really see why the, who these big buy-ins benefit. In, in BitBee's uh, history, essentially, is that we've managed to see small things because we were always playing higher stakes than the guys below us. And we could see these tendencies or we could pass down tendencies that we saw better players doing. But the stables, which didn't do as well, were the guys who just their players were better players than the investors. And mm -hmm. it's very tough for them to make the quick decision to say, OK, this guy has dropped off. 7% or he's gone up 5%, let's move him up, whatever it may be. It's very, very, very tough for 95% of stakers to understand when an investment has changed. Because if I'm offering you a deal and you're a 20% winner, I'm going to offer you a different deal to a 5% winner. Sure, I'm going sure. to offer a 60% winner, a different deal to a 20% winner. Like That's very natural. But if I'm not as good as these players, how can I know when this guy right. from 20% is catching up to the 60% guy? It's based, it's impossible. Right. It's like also, an impossible business model to do. Yeah, and there also seems to be very little flexibility for the staker. So it seems like it's really tough to conquer uh, outside of just having like mass volume of uh, stakies that can kind of like cycle through. So when this guy drops off from 20%, you have another guy who's rising up and he's filling the void. Uh, and maybe you have him well, under a better yeah, contract. Well, even so, that doesn't really, like, what, what, what we realized was, let's say I have, uh, let's say um, you have Berkey who wins 100K and Landon who loses 100K. So I've given Berkey 50K, uh, I keep 50K, and I'm down 100K from Landon. So mm -hmm. I'm actually minus 50K, mm -hmm. even though one guy is, is winning the money, the other guy is losing. Do you know what I mean? So you actually yeah, yeah, need... Yeah. You actually need twice as many people to win as the guy is losing just to be even. Right, right, so right. if you want to make it a profitable business, you have to have like four times as many people winning as the guys who start to lose, you know, which is really tough to do because, you know, if you have 200 guys, how or if you, if it need, then it needs to be on a really large scale, right? So yeah. then if you have 200 guys, how the fuck do you manage to know where 200 guys all are? You know, it, right. it's basic. Like I said, people think poker stake is this easy thing, get rich scheme. But if it was this easy and there's so many successful poker players, there would just be these companies printing millions for 15 years and it's not true. There's no one around, you know.